I think uh, an important factor in our everyday life, and that also applies to meditation, is to check the state of one's mind, you know, whether we are happy, whether we are peaceful, whether um, we are annoyed by things or what's our state of mind and try to apply the virus antidote to the disturbed state of mind and try to keep a happy, peaceful mind. Try to cultivate that, you see, in everyday life to notice, oh, my mind is agitated by this and that. Or, and to apply countermeasure so the nature of our mind is a nature of clear light. No, the mind by itself is peaceful, is happy, is joyous. So why we don't experience that is because we have some disturbance arising in our mind. And then the Lamrim is there to show us different antidote uh, to this disturbance. So if the man is too high, you know, too excited, too joyous because of life brings you some excitement, some good news or good things happening, and the mind tends to become a little bit careless. Uh, then one has to lower a little bit that excitement by remembering that it's not going to last and that, you know, that we still are under control of karma and delusion and anything can happen. Uh, you know, such as sickness and and pain, and so these problems, even they might not be manifest right now. They can lurk us around the corner. So to bring our mind a little bit down from that height. And if the mind is low, is slightly depressed, then to remember that we have this Buddha nature, this Buddha potential, and the mind is fundamentally pure. And we can clean uh, this disturbance by, uh, in our mind. So there are many methods like the nine round breathing, uh, and then if it's, how to say, more enduring obstacle, then we do Vajrasattva or prostration. So to clean this karma, this disturbance in our mind. And if we're lazy, remember that we have this precious human life and it's not going to last. So we have to hurry up. We cannot really relax too much. So like that, uh, most of us know the Lamrim, so we have to use it. You know, we have to use, we have to recognize what state of mind we are in and, and then apply the appropriate antidotes. So that's, once you know these different methods and how they work, this also works very, very useful when you do Shine meditation, right? So Shine meditation, you have obstacles that arise, right? Either the mind gets too excited about things that you're doing and things like that. And then, well, you have to bring that mind down, right? You have to remember, oh, 
maybe you know uh, i'm not gonna live very long and maybe all these projects i have they might happen and they might not and then if the mind is uh, a little bit depressed discouraged they say well you know the, the, the nature of the mind is clear light and it's pure so like Shantideva says, you know, even an insect like a fly has the potential to become Buddha. So if he will become Buddha, so I'm in a bad, much better position of being a human. So like that, you have to use different ways to uplift your mind. And then often as it's difficult to uh, touch our Buddha nature because uh, our mind is, uh, how to say, afflicted by various thoughts and emotion and distraction. So we project that Buddha nature outside in the form of our guru, right? So. So we project this quality onto our guru and we recognize him or her as having all these enlightened qualities. Like uh, those which have met Kandrola recently, or you know, His Holiness Dalai Lama, or those which have met uh, Lama Yeshe or Lama Soparimpuche. So all these beings that embody these qualities right so we we reflect on these enlightened quality in these beings and we try to be the recipient of their love and compassion and then we absorb them in our heart and then we imagine that our own mind receives the quality of these enlightened beings. So our own mind becomes imbued with the quality that we first visualized outside, imagined outside. And then we rest, we, we try to touch the purity of our own mind, the clear and knowing nature of our mind and rest there. So then one does calm abiding on that state and tries to rest in that state and develop the mindfulness of not forgetting, of not getting distracted. And that experience first is kind of dualistic, subject-object, right? We are up in the head and we look down in our heart where the mind's supposed to be, right? The space of pure awareness. And then gradually we try to eliminate this subject and object difference. We just try to become this space of awareness. And then we rest there and we use introspection from time to time to see whether we get distracted or whether the mind becomes dull. So if the mind becomes dull, we put a little bit more attention. And if the mind becomes, uh, how to say, too buoyant, we have to release a little bit. Uh, this tension in the mind. And then we rest in that state of clarity, of pure awareness. And then if gross distraction arise, again, you have to bring your mind down, remembering impermanence. Or if the man is too low, say, oh, 
the mind is in need of clear light, even if I cannot see it at the moment. So you try to see through the cloud instead of being hypnotized by the clouds. And after that, we're going to reflect further on emptiness. This time, I would like to bring the attention on, you see, what is conventional truth and what is ultimate truth. So, you see, if you have a book, So that book depends on cause and condition. So somebody had the idea of writing a book and some people make the paper and other people printed it. And then uh, we bought the book, right? And then we use the book, we get benefit from the book. And then that book gets older and older and the page start falling apart and, and soon it disappear. So that's the conventional nature of the book. And that's valid, valid cognition of the book. So emptiness doesn't bring that away. Emptiness doesn't negate that the book is born, abide a certain amount of time, can be used, brings joy, and then disappears. So when we meditate on it, then we say, okay, so that's a conventional analysis of the book, so that exists. But then when we, on the same book, we apply an ultimate analysis, we say, but where is the book actually? So then you say, oh, it's there on the table, and you touch it. But are you actually touching the book? You're just touching the front cover. Right? So can you touch the book? No, you only touch different parts of the book, but you never touch the book. So if you look for the book, it's not the front cover, it's not the back cover, it's neither of the page. And apart from all these parts, there's no book to be found. So there's actually, if you inquire, you look for the book in its parts, the collection of its parts are separate, you don't find that book. So ultimately, there's no book there existing from its own side. So if you apply an ultimate analysis, you don't find the book. If you apply a conventional analysis, there is a book there that you can buy and use and, and give as a gift and so forth. So there's two levels of reality, two ways that you can interact with the book on a conventional level and then on the ultimate level. So when you don't find the inherent book under ultimate analysis, then you say, but how does the book exist? As a mere imputation by the subjective mind. So the mind project, label book, on this front back cover and the page that can be read. So you impute book. So there's a mainly labeled book.
So then you try to bring the two together. So you buy a Meili label book, you read a Meili label book, you enjoy a Meili label book, you let the Meili label book, you get it back. So, so conventionally the book exists. What you have negated with emptiness is that it exists from its own side. So you haven't negated the book. You have negated its inherent existence. So this then you try to apply to your body, to your mind, to your eye. So everything exists, but like a dream, like a mirage, and so forth. So it's important to be able to combine this conventional reality and this ultimate reality, because otherwise emptiness can be how to say, it's easy to, to think, oh, things don't exist ultimately, but then how do they function conventionally? You see, one is not able to unify both. One feels that emptiness kind of uh, undermines conventional reality and conventional reality undermines ultimate reality. So that means like it says in the, in the Guru Puja, you know, as long as these two things we are not able to combine in our mind, this understanding is, means that our, our experience, our understanding is not yet correct. So emptiness shouldn't uh, contrad uh, cont uh, contradict or undermine conventional reality and conventional reality shouldn't undermine emptiness. So they, they have to work together. They have to complement each other. So this is uh, really important to, to work on it, you know? So emptiness is not just the absence of something and then you're not able to figure out how it actually functions. So last time we used the letter A, right? So what we negate is the third appearance that the A appear from his own side. And then you look for that A, you don't find it in any of the three strokes and neither separate. So there's no A there from his own side, but there's the A that is mainly designated by the mind on this three stroke. So when you negate the book, it's like this third level where, where the A appears from his own side. So the book appears from his own side, and then you don't find that book anywhere. So ultimately, there's no book at all from an ultimate analysis point of view. You don't find a book there at all. And that experience is very important to get to the point that ultimately the book doesn't exist at all. Because if there's something left, there's something to be attached to. There's something to have aversion for. But if there's nothing there at all, what are you attached to? You see, there's, as long as there's something remaining, there's something to be attached to. But if there's nothing there at all, what are you attached to? So, for example, there are books, 
you know, which are beautifully handwritten with, uh, uh, with uh, how to say, powder of uh, precious stone and gold and silver with beautiful ornaments and drawings handwritten in letters of gold. And I don't know, um, when you go in a museum, you see these books from the Middle Age that were that uh, people used to handwrite. And they're so beautiful. And they uh, are valued at millions and millions of dollars, right? So they are very precious. So it's something that is easy to get attached to, right? But then if we inquire and look for the book and don't find it at all, then you cannot get attached to it, right? Because it's not there at all. But yet, conventionally, the book still exists. The book was written by some people, and it's very valuable, right? On a conventional level, but then on the ultimate level, you don't find it at all. So unless you get to that doesn't exist at all, ultimately, there's still the potential of attachment. So there you see the value of emptiness, right? If ultimately it doesn't exist at all, what am I attached to? But yet conventionally it exists as mere imputation by the mind. So you apply that to things like a book, but then you have to apply that to your partner, to your children, and things that you are actually attach to. And then if you do it properly, you come to that emptiness, that person ultimately doesn't exist at all. The person at, I'm attached to, doesn't exist at all ultimately. So what am I attached to? So who am I attached to? So that's when emptiness actually works. Is you, if when you come to that point, that person doesn't exist at all ultimately. Yet, conventionally, that person exists. We interact in everyday life. We do things together and so forth. But that person in reality exists as a mere name, as a mere designation. So like that, um, if one meditates like that, then gradually emptiness becomes really effective. You see? You really have to come to that point that ultimately that person doesn't exist. Ultimately, the situation doesn't exist. You cannot find it from its own side at all. Yet, relatively, it exists in dependence on cause and condition and so forth. It functions. So ultimately, you don't find anything. So everything exists only conventionally as a mere imputation by mind.
So ex everything exists in mere name, mere designation by the mind. So in the summer, when you drive, it's easy to see some kind of mirage at the on the road, you know. So because of the heat, so at the distance one sees some kind of uh, almost like there's uh, a thin layer of water on top of the road, but as you drive closer to that place where there was water, uh, that that mirage-like appearance moves further away in the distance. So you realize that actually there's no water there. It just appears as water. So like that, you see, the objects, everything appear to us, the people, everything appear to us. But if you inquire into its essence, you only find emptiness. Yet things appear and depend on, on cause and condition. But if you want to find an essence or something deep inside, you don't find. And when you are able to experience emptiness uh, in this way, you go deeper, deeper, and you really don't find things under ultimate analysis, then there is peace. You see all phenomena have the same taste of being empty. So they only exist conventionally, superficially. They only exist in main name. And that's the final antidote to all our mental affliction. And then one tries to unify that with how development of love and compassion. See, on the base of equanimity, a friend, enemy, and stranger, one tries to develop a warm heart. So in the six cause, one effect, one focus on how all beings have been one's mother, or have been one's father, or have been one's grandparent, have been one's partner. So all beings have been a source of comfort and joy to us. So we try to cultivate that state of mind that all beings have been our friends. And we try to see them in that positive way. Instead of seeing them as people we don't know, like stranger, we try to see them as friends. And on that base, develop the wish for them to be happy. So we try to live with that warm heart. So we try to stabilize cultivate and stabilize this warm heart towards everyone one encounters.
And like that, one tries to unify or cultivate emptiness and compassion. All right, so we're going to do the Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga and do the meditation. So the purpose of our spiritual practice is really to realize emptiness, the emptiness of inherent existence, which removes all our mental affliction. And to be an embodiment of love and compassion in our everyday life and then try to unify these two experiences. So in order to do so, we clean our mind through the practice of uh, Guru Yoga and try to get the blessing of our gurus. so that they inspire us and they imbue our mind with their qualities. So we start with uh, observing our breath or the nine round breathing to bring our mind to a neutral state. And then in space of ourself, we imagine the Buddha, Shakyamuni.
And then we reflect on what Shakyamuni Buddha represent to us, for us. What qualities, kindness, So in one way, Shakyamuni Buddha lived 2,500 years ago and had such an impact that uh, his teaching are practiced and realized generation after generation up to the present day. So due to his kindness, we are introduced to the pure nature of our mind, our Buddha potential. But also Shakyamuni Buddha is present right now since the Dhammakaya, the omniscient mind pervades everywhere. So Shakyamuni Buddha is right now present with us in our room. spontaneously manifested from the Dharmakaya. So we try to communicate with him from our heart. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. By my virtuous actions of giving and so on, may I become a Buddha to benefit all beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. By my virtuous actions of giving and so on, May I become a Buddha to benefit all beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened. To the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. By my virtuous actions of giving and so on. May I become a Buddha to benefit all beings. One tries to absorb the blessing from Shakyamuni Buddha and meditate on the space-like nature of mind, emptiness. Uh, 
and one can arise as one's yi dam <coughs> or yamantaka. And for those, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, who don't uh, practice Tantra, they just visualize their own body as a light energy body. Then one tries to open one's heart towards all living being by realizing that they all have been very close to us. They have been one's parents, one's partner, one's children, one's friends, and that we care for them. We wish them to be happy and free from problem. So we try to induce a warm heart that radiates light rays to all direction, towards everyone. May all beings have equanimity, free of attachment and aversion. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings find good rebirth and the bliss of liberation. Then we try to see our environment as a manifestation of our consciousness, a pure consciousness, nature of bliss and emptiness as a pure land. So the room we are in, we try to see it as a pure as a pure realm of blissful rainbow light energy. May the ground everywhere be pure. Free of roughness and all flow, soft as the palm of a child's hand, smooth as polished blue sapphire. And we imagine that we create with our mind and our imagination uh, beautiful parks, beautiful flower, trees, waterfalls, 
whatever is beautiful to our mind that uh, we have seen recently. So we create um, all this beauty that we multiply infinitely and we offer to all the enlightened beings. May all space with some abundance, clouds of offering be filled, offerings human and divine, both actual and imagined. O Namo Bhagavate Vajasava Madhana Dadagavaya, Arati Samyak Sam Budaya Tayanda Om Vajra Vajama Vajama Tezaj Ma Vidya Vajama Bodhichita Vajama Bodhimodhata Savakama Avarana Vijodana Vajayasu Om Namo Bhagavate Vajasa Bhamadana Dabhagavaya Arati Samyak Sam Budaya Tayanda Om Vajra Vajama Vajama Tezaj Ma vidya vajama bodhicitta vajama bodhinami. Savagama avarana vijodana vajami so om namo bhagavad vajami namami. Arade samita vajami vajami om vajama vajami vajami vajami. Ma vidya vajama bodhicitta vajama bodhinami vajami. Savakama avarana vijodana vajami so in a space in front of oneself on imagine the pure land of Tushita. Where at the moment Matriya Buddha. Atishala, Matsankapa, and many holy beings, many enlightened beings live. So in the center of a palace, there is Matreya Buddha sitting on a throne. And the two hands are in the teaching mudra. So again, we feel that Maitreya Buddha is there with us, that he's aware that we think of him, that he sends love and compassion and bliss towards us, joy. And from the clear light mind in his heart, comes Amatsan Kappa, Kya Sabje, Kya Drupje. So comes a cloud to the space in front of us in our room. So again, we try to feel the presence of Lama Tsongkhapa, Kiel Sabje, and Kedrupje in our room. We can also Imagine they are inseparable from His Holiness Dalai Lama, Lama Yeshe, Lama Zopar Rinpoche, or any of our other teacher. So 
So the thing you feel when you're in the presence of an enlightened teacher, you can feel exactly the same thing in your room If you have good imagination, good faith, good devotion, from their side, they are here with us, it's our own. Obscuration that creates the veil, so the pure our mind, the more we feel in their presence, whenever we invoke them. Yo emani don snow white cloud from the heart of Buddha Matre, Savior of hundred devas joyful, Losandra Baal knowing king of Dharma with you to her disciple. I beseech you, please come before me. In space on lion throne, Lord to Samu, my kind guru smiling with delight, is the supreme feel for my faithful mind. Please forever abide and teach us. You holy man knows all phenomena, you fluent speech, a sweet melody. For the years of fortune it be, you form resplendent with fame's glory. I prostrate to you who is meaningful, to see, hear, and also bring to mind. Your water and wild orange flower, fragrant in suns like perfume and Clouds of offering real and magic, I offer you supreme refuge. Non virtues of body, speech, and mind, transgressions of my three sets of vows. From me that sins beginning less that all I confess deeply from my heart. In these times of degeneration, you made your life highly meaningful. Renounce all the eight worldly counsel, stop for knowledge and realizations. In your extensive accomplishment, I rejoice deeply within my heart. Dharma in Dharma Kaya's clear sky, from clouds of wisdom and compassion, please rain down vast and profound Dharma upon us for to name this temple. I dedicate all of this virtue to the Dharma or living beings, and especially the, the hard teachings of Law Sandra Parim and Corel. He is ground adorned with perfume and flowers. 
Mount Meru for Imagine and offer as a pure land. May all be enjoy this I send forth this joy to you, my precious rose. So while we recite the mantra of uh, Mitsema, so three rays of light come from the heart of Lama Tsongkhapa, Kyatsabje Ketrupje, that merge into one beam of light and uh, enter into us and grant us first clean our mind from all our mental afflictions and grant us all the realization and then if we want to develop the quick intelligence, we can imagine that in the, each atom of the light energy is a syllable D, D-H-I. And you, all these orange uh, little D, uh, bless your mind so that you develop a sharp intelligence. Dime <laughs>
Then you imagine that the thrones on which they sit, they absorb into the lotus upward. And then Kelsabje and Kelsabje merge into Lama Tsongkhapa. And then Lama Tsongkhapa comes to sit on top of your head facing the same direction as you, like uh, when you recite uh, Vajrasattva Mantra. So you imagine his central channel is completely aligned with your central channel. Is you Lama Tsongkhapa is inseparable from your root guru, inseparable from his holiness, from Lama Yeshe, from Lama Zopa. And at his head chakra, there's a white arm. At his throat, there's a red arm. And at his heart, a blue arm. And as uh, we recite these three mantra, uh, you imagine that light rays vibrates and pours down through his body into your own body, and you get the blessing of his holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. That they that the vibration of the mantra opens these two, these three chakra in your own body and purify uh, negative imprints of body, speech, and mind, and will help you to reveal the clear light nature of your own mind. So we take a deep breath. Oh. Um. And then our precious root guru merge into a sphere of light. And 
that sphere of light enters by the top of our head and first comes to rest in our head chakra. So his nature is a brilliant, blissful light. And then he gently moves downward towards the throat chakra and again stops there and blesses and awakens our throat chakra. And then gently he comes down and comes to rest in our heart chakra. So our guru in the nature of a sphere of light is in nature of bliss and infinite warm love. that radiates and pervades our body completely. So filling one's body with blissful, loving, clear light. And we imagine that the shape of our body disappears and we just rest in this oneness with our goose clear light mind of love and bliss. And now for 10 minutes, we try to establish a continuity of being in that state and use introspection from time to time to check whether we get distracted or dull and apply the antidote.
Milarepa gives the image of a big eagle flying high in the sky, which only from time to time flap his wings. Otherwise, he just floats into space. So we too, we rest in this vast space of pure awareness. And from time to time, we check whether we still focused on it. And hold it tighter or a little bit looser according to the need. But mostly we rest in the space of pure awareness. So now from a perspective of relative truth, I say my thought, 
my mind, my body, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So on a conventional level, this is completely valid. But if one inquires in the mind, in the space of awareness, where is this inherent I? So wherever the thought of I bubbles up in your mind, you chase it and look. And if it would be really there, the more you would look, the more you will able to find it. But the more you look for the eye, more like a mirage, it disappears. So try to chase the eye and not find it. And then remain in this non-finding of the I, this non-duality, this zero of I-ness. And then when he pops up somewhere else, again you chase it. And again you don't find it and you rest in that zero, this non finding at all of the I. So the I with all its planets of thought, emotion, habit, memory. We try to make all that vanish and there's only space of emptiness. So there's no inherent I to be found anywhere. Yet conventionally I exist as a mere designation onto the body and mind. Uh, 
And then we reflect on this verse from the Lama Chopa. to induce compassion, which is the foundation of the Mahayana. Considering how all pitiful beings have been my mothers, who raised me in kindness again and again, inspire me to develop effortless compassion for them, like that of a loving mother for her darling child. And we dedicate uh, the good thoughts and spiritual aspiration that we have had. By the merit of this virtue, may I become a Buddha and lead all living beings into that enlightened state. By the precious bodhicitta that has not yet born, arise and grow. And may that born not decline, but increase more and more. In the snowy mountain paradise, you're the source of all happiness and good. Powerful tents in Gyatso Chenrezig, please remain until Samsara ends. Savior of the snowlands teaching and being, you clarify the path that unifies emptiness and compassion. Lotus holder tents in Gyatso, may all your wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Fearless teacher and assembly of the children of the victorious one, Shravaka, Pratyeka, Buddhas, victorious Losang, father and son, along with the lineage master, all the object of refuge of infinite lands, please bestow the virtue and goodness of accomplishing this prayer here and now. Holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teachings, through explanation and practice, you are the armor of patience that is never discouraged, and comparable, venerable guru, to you I make request. While striving single-pointedly for the sake of victory is one's teaching, the sole gateway through which all benefit and, and happiness emerge. And for a mother living being, you suddenly departed to peace. What a great loss. Nevertheless, to the undeceiving truth of the blessings of the ocean of the three jewels and the grave wave of bodhicitta of the children of the victorious ones, may the smile of a reincarnation swiftly be in glory for fortunate disciples. All right, so for those who have to go, please uh, go about your daily life. And for those who would like to have some questions, uh, you're welcome. We have a few questions now, if you like. Yeah. 
can unmute and uh, ask your questions or put something in the chat if you need to. There are many notes of thanks in the chat. Roy Harvey wrote, nice independent Independence Day gift. Thank you, Venerable Renee. Marion wrote, thank you. Patricia. Okay, so. Um... There's no question. So, um, uh, the class will continue till, um, I think, uh, two weeks into um, August. Then I'm going to Switzerland for a week. Then I'm going to Copan for a lamp of the path. And then I go back to, I stay a month in Nepal, and then I go to Switzerland for another three weeks. So, uh, yeah, from mid-August till uh, mid-October, I will be away traveling. So we won't have class then. No. So I think we have uh, uh, July, I think we have maybe six six classes left, okay? Venerable mm -hmm. Renee, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that you at one point you said that the Dharmakaya is the is the Dharmakaya the omniscient mind, is that right? Yes. And so and that pervades everything, everyone, everywhere. Yes. It's all around us all the time. Yes. Okay. So that's how we can imagine Shakyamuni and in our right here with us now. I loved what you said. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank yes. you. There's also another uh, tool that sometimes is helpful when you meditate on Shine uh, on the nature of the mind. There's an uh, in the Kagyu, they will say that or Enigma also, they say the thoughts are light rays of the Dharmakaya. So, so the distractions, they're also manifestation from the Dharmakaya, right? So you can see them as, you can see your thoughts, your emotion as Sambhogakaya, right? So, so as the light rays of the Dharmakaya. So if you meditate on that while uh, meditating on the nature of the mind and whatever thought, emotion arise, you try to see them as light rays of the Dharmakaya. So this helps for them not to invade your mind, not to, um, how to say, instead of see them as enemy, as distraction, you see them as friend, as just the Dharmakaya in another form. And then they don't distract your mind. So it's kind of a nice, nice way of looking at it. I have a question, if it's possible. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, maybe it's not. But, so I, I don't understand. There is the basis of things. Then the, we have labeling, and then we have in, independent, uh, existing independently. So if we are working on the um third level 
we are mm -hmm. keeping the label of things as granted. But my question is, are we reaching enlightenment within a human mind? I don't know if it makes sense. Because well, the label uh, is already human. So, you know, it's like we are labeling notebook as a notebook, not the fly. The fly is not the labeling as notebook. Uh, you, 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 your speech gets broken up, so I cannot, uh, I didn't understand your whole sentence. But uh, what I got from, so you have two levels of uh, mind, right? So from the sutra perspective, it's our ordinary mind that reaches enlightenment. And from a, a higher yoga tantra perspective, it's a more subtle level of consciousness, a more subtle level of mind. You know, so you have the ordinary mind, then you have the subtle mind, and then the very subtle mind. So, in tantra, is the very subtle mind that actually reaches enlightenment is not our ordinary mind, right? So that's why in tantra one tries to awaken this more subtle level of mind. Right, that to, by bringing the energy inside the, inside the central channel, which uh, where reside the more the subtle mind, and then you try to bring the energy into the heart chakra, where reside the more subtle mind. Right. So, from a high yoga tantra perspective, is this more subtle level of mind that reaches enlightenment, and that's uh, the space of mind in which the Buddhas live. And so a Buddha never goes back to more grosser level of mind. He always remains in this more subtle level. But in terms of realizing emptiness, whether you do it with the gross mind or with the subtle mind, is exactly the same emptiness. So in terms of uh, what you try to find is that the inherent existent I, the inherent existent body, inherent existent mind, inherent existent friend is not there, right? So you, you, you get to this absence of inherent existence. So that's the emptiness, ultimate reality. But then when you come back to the conventional reality, how do things exist on the conventional level? by merely imputed by the mind, right? So like, you know, the third level of A is not there, but then when you come out of that, not finding that A, the A that remains is the one that is merely imputed on the three strokes, right? On the three bar. So that exists conventionally. So that's Lama Tsongkhapa's interpretation. The other schools uh, don't make that distinction between uh, conventional reality and merely label conventional reality. Thank you. There's another question in the chat from Jeff because his internet's not strong. He said, what was recited right after the Mitzigma recitation today? Oh, uh, because sometimes I there's the long one, the long Mitzigma, the nine, the line, the nine line one. So sometimes I automatically recite that one. So that was my mistake. It wasn't in the text. No, because there is a four line one, and there's a five line one, and there's nine line one. Uh, praise to Lama Tsongkhapa. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh, there's another in the chat. Uh, I'm working with a great amount of pain in my merely labeled body. This physical pain I know is also merely labeled as the body is too. I try to work with the pain in this manner. I also try to work with giving and taking of this pain from all beings, is that this pain is taken away from all beings as well. I still struggle with a strong pain, which seems to take over my mind. 
I try to melt the pain into golden light and yet it persists. I'm also trying to purify this pain. What other methods could I use? I think at our level, you cannot make the pain go away. You see, when you have a physical pain, um, you cannot make the pain go away. To be able to make the pain go away, you you must be able to bring the you, your consciousness to a different level. So you must be able to bring the wind into the central channel. So there... You, you so from going you need to go out from the gross body into the subtle body and then you don't feel the gross body anymore right but for us you cannot make the pain go away what you can do is use the pain to develop love compassion body chitta you know with tonglen and then with emptiness you you try to that, that, that there is no I that has aversion to the pain, that, so that you that even though your physical body has pain, your mind is at peace, right? So that's what emptiness does when you have physical pain. It doesn't make the pain, the physical pain, go away, but your mind is at peace. It doesn't have aversion to the to the pain. He doesn't want the pain go away. The mind is just at peace with the pain. And then for those which have a certain level of concentration, so if you have pain in one part of the body, but by folk, focalizing your attention somewhere else than where the pain is because your concentration is quite strong so you you get away from the location of the pain and you don't feel the pain as much anymore because it's like you know you, you the the pain is on the back burner and you focus so strongly on something else so you don't feel the pain so much anymore no. so that's you know, for those which have a certain level of concentration, they can do that. Go ahead. But most, uh, yeah, I think the, at our level, you know, doing Tonglen and try to experience and being at peace with the pain, I think that's a level where we can work with you know, uh, at our beginner level. You know, so we can use the pain to increase one's love, compassion, bodhicitta, and purify our negative karma. And then try to see that there's no I having the pain. You know, kind of like that. Yeah, so I think that's, yeah. And then... Uh, in everyday life, so one tries to reduce one's pain, um, you know, by doing whatever physical, you know, seeing doctor, taking medicine, and doing exercise and so forth. So, yeah, one has to try to get our our body our body in as good as possible condition. Yeah. Arya has her hand up too. Yeah, Arya. Talia. <laughs> Hi, Venable Renee. It's great to see you. Um, so when we were doing the medit, so I'm just trying to clear um uh clarify in my mind that when we're trying to do the when we're doing the meditation of not finding, I find it, I always found it, the A or the book. However, today I found that if I was finding the A or the book the moment ago then I will not find it. Is that the right um, kind of way to find not finding the A or the book, the merely labeled A? By introducing somehow, it naturally happened that if I see the impermanence of the previous concept, 
then I'm able to not find it. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is, is that, um, you know, Lama Tsongkhapa explained like that, but he says himself that actually it's impossible to distinguish um, the merely label A from the from the inherently existent A, you know. So for us, they are inseparable. Till till we have direct experience of emptiness, you are not able to make this distinction. Yet, uh, as a tool, we imagine that we have this capacity, right? So conceptually, we imagine, you know, that we're able to distinguish the inherent existent uh, A from the merely label A, you know. Because uh, how to say, when you look at A, automatically it just appears as inherently existent, you know? And so you can, with the conceptual mind, see, ah, yes, there's only three stroke on which I impute, but it's completely inseparable from the inherent existent A, you know? You, you, you cannot actually just see uh, the three stroke on which you impute, you know, the inherent A is always glued onto it. You know, you cannot separate. Yeah, conceptually, you can make that mental gymnastic, you know, that mental exercise of separating, you know, but in experience, they are not uh, separate for us. You know? And they say it's like that till we have direct experience of emptiness. Only then can you distinguish inherent existence from merely label to your own experience. So then how do we get to that direct experience of emptiness? Get beyond the uh, conceptual practice. I think it's uh, one isolate inherent existence, you know, one try to recognize. So inherent existence is something that doesn't depend on anything else, right? So this, non-dependence uh, on anything else has three levels, right? Not depending on cause and condition, not depending on parts. So these are helpful level, but the, the, real, the real point is it, they exist uh, independent from the mind imputing it, right? So where it has to lead us to is to realize that things depend on the mind that labels it, right? Like the A depends on the mind that labels it A, right? There's no A there from his own side. Like that, you know, the I, René, doesn't exist from his own side. You know, René exists simply being merely imputed on the body and mind, right? There's no René in there within the mind there's no René inside the body. There's no René that possesses the body. There's no René that possesses the thoughts, right? So like that one does that exercise of not finding the inherent René. And then what's left when you come out of that not finding the inherent René is the merely label René. So that's the exercise one does again and again and again. And it gets more and more flavor, you know, more and more flavor. Mm. Thank you, Bimbo. Okay. So I think that's all for today. Thank you very much for joining so that we meditate together. It also inspires me to do by seeing how well you meditate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see you moving thought. I just see you non-moving body. <laughs> mm.